during capital punishment. 1 Samuel 15, I'm going to begin by reading the whole chapter. Today we're talking about put to death, sins of rebellion, sins of rebellion. 1 Samuel chapter 15 reads like this. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek. And utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not. But slay both man and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Canaanites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you shewed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote Am the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is, over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he has set up a place, and has gone out, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord! I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meanest then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way of the Lord, which, or the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. 
And Samuel turned about to go away. And he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and rent it. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came delicately, or came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Back at the beginning of this chapter, beginning in verse 2 there, the Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep and camel and ass. And so a very, very harsh punishment is issued to Amalek. And this actually regarding events, it's, it's the consequence of events that had happened many, many years before. See, God in our studies, we're going to learn, has given us many uh, capital punishments that he issues to individuals based on crimes of the individuals. Uh, God can't punish countries in the same way. And so quite often what he'll do is he'll use other countries to issue punishments to specific countries for sins that at large they have committed. You can go to Exodus chapter 17, and keep your finger there, but in Exodus chapter 17 is the story as it's told. Exodus chapter 17, and in verse 8, the Bible says, Then came Amalek, and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand up on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so, as you read down, you're going to find this is the tale, that great story where, as Moses lifted the rod of God, so they succeeded against fighting and destroying Amalek. But every time his arm came down, because he was weak, Amalek prevailed. Verse 12 says, But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him and sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hand, the one the one side and the other the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And so therefore they were able to discomfit, it says here, the people of Amalek. And they destroyed them with the sword. Such was the charge that in verse 14 it says, I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And so they were to be destroyed extremely for the case of what had just happened. Now, in the context, you only read that Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And that doesn't seem like such a, a grievous task that, or a grievous uh, thing that many years later God would still want recompense for it. But go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and we'll get a little more clarity about what actually happened here. Deuteronomy 25. <clears throat> what would make it so that God would require that they be utterly put out of remembrance, these people of the Amalekites? Deuteronomy chapter 25, look at verse 17. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt? Here it is. How he met thee by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary. And he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. 
thou shalt not forget it. So God even recorded it in his law that this was something that he was going to settle in such a time as they entered into their land for the grievous sin. What was their grievous sin? When they met a tired and exhausted and, and, and travel-weary Israel, they didn't have the guts to come at them face to face. No, they took advantage of their feebleness and actually went to the hindermost of the tribes as they were marching in their way, to the feeble, and destroyed them. The Bible records that they feared not God at such a time. Because somebody that's destroying innocent lives, purposely going after the weak and the, and the feeble and the exhausted and the young and the women, which is what Amalekites did here, fears not God. There's no fear of God before their eyes. It's a wicked thing to do. And so God had it, and go back to 1 Samuel 15, that they would be utterly destroyed at such a time as this. And it was Saul's duty to perform the doing of it at this time. Verse 3 of 1 Samuel 15, God gives the charge. He says, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. Why would they spare them not? Because at the time... Amalekites spared not the feeble of Israel. Is that what the Bible records in Deuteronomy 25? It says, but slay men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And this is just a picture of God showing that whatsoever ye reap, even as a nation, that shall ye sow. And so because they came and destroyed man and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass, the hindermost of the tribes of Israel, when they're already weary with journey, and Malachites were about to receive the same at the hands of King Saul. They had, they had arrived into the promised land, and that was God's decision and God's timing that he would charge Saul to spare them not. God says, spare them not. What happens? Look at verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag. God says, spare not, and Saul spares. And this is an act of rebellion. Rebellion is essentially open resistance to established authority. God says, spare them not whose authority is higher but the Lord's. And the response is, I spared them. Therefore, in complete and utter resistance and denial of the authority and the charge that was given, Saul acts in rebellion here. And because of Saul's rebellious act, what does he find? He finds a loss of his position. Look at verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. The loss of his position. And what exactly did he do? The opposite of what God had charged him to do. God said, Spare not. In verse 9, he spared them. What was his actual sin? The second part of verse 11. He turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And yet Saul, in his boldness and in his arrogancy, stands before the prophet of God. And when God says, you have not performed my commandments, look what Saul says in verse 13. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. You'll come and rejoice with us. We're going to have a big offering. Because his idea was that, oh, the people were the ones that did. Or he's least covered from them. But as the leader of the people, it was his responsibility to give the marching orders as they came from God, distribute them to the people so that the people did exactly what God expected to them at the time. What was expected? Spare them not. Destroy them all. Men and women, suckling and ox, camel and ass. All of it needs to be destroyed. Why? Because this is a recompense for what they did to your fathers so many years ago. And so, in rebellion, the people acted. And so, the people will suffer the consequence, and the king here will suffer the greatest of consequences. Though he says, yet I have performed what was expected of me, it is clear that he hath not performed and instead has acted in rebellion against God. Look at verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord? Good question. Do our sacrifices somehow wipe out any obedience that we have to do? Some of us tend to think so at times. Some of us think, oh, if I just do enough soul winning, there's my sacrifice, and therefore I can just act like the world the rest of the week. 
Some of the people say, you know, if I give offerings, if I give lots of money to the church, the Catholic Church is famous for this, right? If I give lots of money, I can go on and live like the devil. And the off or the sacrifice and the offering that I give will surely negate any obedience to the word of the Lord I have to do. No one's going to actually boldly say that from their mouth. But that's the mindset that people get. They think if they do enough good works, it's some sort of karma plan with God. Where you do enough good works, you don't really have to be that obedient. But God is clear here when he says through the prophet Samuel, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Every time. Without question. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Listening and obeying God, listening to his word as an enters in and doing exactly what he says is by far the most important thing in this walk as well as our walk as Christians. And yet Saul does seem to escape him. Because he saw this sort of balancing act where he's like, well, you know, at least where he kept back part of Agag's bounty for the purpose of performing another duty and ritual and sacrifice and giving unto God. So surely it, it balances out, but not so. Obedience is always best. Rebellion is the last thing that you want to do before a holy God. Look what he says in verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. From being preacher. From being mom. From being dad. From being, who knows, what authority have you been given in your life that if you reject the word of the Lord, you can be rejected from taking upon? God can have you fired from your job. You reject the word of the Lord. You think you're going to do something better. And he just rejects you from that position of authority, of power, of responsibility, whatever it is. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Lord, especially as a believer. He'll punish you in this life. And his, his punishment for Saul was, you're not going to be a king anymore. How do kings normally expire? They don't, they don't exactly that. They don't retire. They don't just relax. And Kings are normally slain. <laughs> Or, or, or overrun and destroyed and taken captives, or they just die. Like, king, when you're not king anymore, that's basically God saying your time is up. You're numbered, right? There's, there's no exit plan for a king except for, except for death. And quite often it comes, you know, by old age, sure. Or quite often it comes from just by means of God removing protection from you. And we all know how Saul ended up dying in the heat of the battle without the protection of God. After going and talking with witches... Go figure, that was the end of him going to seek after the counsel of a witch after he performs essentially witchcraft and rebellion in this act. Now what is witchcraft? And this is my first point regarding uh, put to death, regarding the death penalty. Witchcraft is when you say the right words, when you follow the right sequence, when you add the right ingredients and you do it all to get a desired end. If anybody's dabbled in witchcraft in your past, or has done any kind of study in it, essentially witchcraft is just the manipulation of elements and things of this world in order to make moves in the spiritual realm. People try to do all sorts of tricks, all sorts of gimmicks, all sorts of games, saying words, you know, I have a, first, a sequence of words, or there's a right sequence of actions, or I'm going to do a, a certain activity, and that's going to get me favor with the gods, the spiritual world. And that's what witchcraft essentially is. How do we see it quite often? Um, we see it in those Ouija boards. We see it in the meditation states where people find a peace from uh, getting into a contemplative, med uh, a contemplative meditation state. Psychics, another form of witchcraft. There's all sorts of things that you find. Astrology as well is one of them. Where people try to do a sequence of acts, do a certain work in order to get favor from the spiritual realm. This is men trying to act as gods. Trying to control the spiritual realm. Something that we have no, no um, access to otherwise but through the living God. Which is how righteously we should get favor from spirits and from the angelic world. And how God would send perhaps a guardian angel to, to help you in a situation. Stop the mouths of lions as it were, right? But that only comes by way of the proper channel is going to God and asking him to basically dispatch those things. Do you know what people do when they're in rebellion? Witches do when they're in rebellion? They bypass the Lord, go straight to the devils, and try to get favor from them. The Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Okay? Old Testament and now today. Our government should put witches to death. That should not be common practice in and amongst our people in this nation. It shouldn't be so. 
Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, because this is as rebellion in the highest order and is worthy of the death penalty. And in the last days, we're going to see more of this garbage because the Antichrist and the false prophet will come together and by policy cause that craft would prosper. We're going to see a, a, just a huge explosion of witchcraft in these last days. And it's going to be a big shock to a lot of people that don't understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to keep that focus in charge. But when we have people, men, who are possessed, perhaps, who are able to channel and conjure and work with demonic spirits, and we as Christians should expect that we're going to see some weird stuff in these last days where God promised that craft would prosper and it's going to come by way of the authorities, even governmentally, allowing it to be so. And even making, making provision for it. They're going to basically pave the way that witchcraft would be essentially one of the only, if not the only, acceptable religions in the last days. Interesting thing about witchcraft is that's exactly what you get when you look at Hinduism, when you look at Buddhism, when you look at Roman Catholicism, when you look at basically every other religion. Because what do they do? We say Jesus did all the works, promised through his word that we can believe on him and go to heaven. And any favor that we get, we get by obeying his words. That's the Christian walk. Every other religion, say the right words, follow the right sequence, add the right ingredients, and then you get the desired favor from the Spirit. Right? It's witchcraft. Two religions in this world, Bible Christianity and witchcraft. I tell people that all the time at the door. I'm usually a little lighter than it. I don't just outright say witchcraft, but I say Bible Christianity and works, okay? And works is rebellion against God. And works to attain salvation is you going in some other door to try to get to heaven. It's witchcraft and nothing more. And that's rebellion against God. That's the first point, witchcraft. I suffer not a witch to live. They ought to be put to death. Curse father or mother. Go to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. And these all fall under the umbrella and under the banner of rebellion. Rebellious acts. Exodus chapter 21. And look at verse 17. Exodus 21 verse 17. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. What else does it say in that same context? Look at verse 15. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. In another place, in Leviticus 20, verse 9, you don't have to go there, it says, his blood shall be upon him. In other words, the death penalty is one that actually requires shedding of blood, unfortunately. So um, that, I believe, would be stoning uh, who knows what other things they would use. But his blood shall be upon him that doeth what? Curseth his mother or father, smiteth his mother or father. This is a serious crime, and, and, and many these days, rebellious and even devilish children, might even scoff at something like this being presented. And now those rebellious children that grew up with, uh, with you know, uh, liberal boomer parents that never punished them for anything or never corrected them for anything or had no sort of punishment dictated and given out for doing wrong, they're going to scoff at this, and now they're a lot older, and they're like, this is archaic, this is barbaric, this is wicked, this is horrible, and they're saying all this about the law of God, which we know is perfectly just, right, and true. And it's clear. Curse your mother and father, death. Smite your mother and father, death. This is something that they'll scoff at, but it's even in the Ten Commandments. Look over Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. It says, honor thy father and thy mother. This is, this is the antithesis to cursing them, to smiting them. You're to honor thy father and thy mother, look at this, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2 reckons this as the first commandment with promise. Well, it's not the first commandment of the ten. It is the first that comes with the promise. And what is it? That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Long days, long life, security in the land that you live in, and is it any wonder today why Canada is having so many struggles in their land? <laughs> because we don't honor father and mother, we, we coop them up into, uh, into retirement homes. And now we pull out all the security that they would have. We say, oh, those nurses can't even go there and help them. People can't even go there and visit them. You know the number one reason why those old folks are dying in there? It's just from simply being being neglected. 
They're making it so that uh, a nurse can't work a job here at this building and then go to this building and then go to this building. And that's coming from our government that dictated it so because they don't want to spread the COVID. And yet, what's the alternative? Now this nurse that uh, in, a, in a field that already had minimal, um, minimal amount of support and amount of people working, laboring in it, no nurses to support it. The one that would go to three and would work the extra hours and go and help these people and show them some compassion now can only go work at one. Then they take it and they, they, they remove all visits. And so instead of the mothers and the fathers being properly honored, now albeit it's, it's wicked even to try to, to put them in that place, though there's circumstances where somebody might need more care. Okay, I appreciate that. For, but by and large, people shove the fathers and mothers over in the retirement home just to get them off their chest. Now there's no chance of visits. Now there's no chance of, of aid. And they're just letting these people die, letting these people rot. If they do get sick, who's going to care for them and mend them? Who's going to kind of keep them? That's why you see just hordes of these people dying off. And the government loves to have that because then they can broadcast. Look at all these deaths in these old folks' homes. Look at how awful this COVID thing is because all these people are dying. Yeah, because you neglected them. Of course they're dying. There's no, there, there's no activities for them. Some of them used to just like to go down and play some bridge. Go down and sing some karaoke. And I don't agree with them, but some of them used to even just go down and once a week have a drink with some of their friends, okay? Alcohol is wicked, but it was something for these people to look forward to, to do, to, to have fellowship, to have company, to have some sort of life. And when you have no purpose and you have no life, no wonder you die. You just give up. People expire because they just, why? Why live? What's the purpose? And this is happening. And so here in our nation, which I believe the Lord thy God hath given us this land, now we don't have any promise of long days. Now we don't have any promise of long life. Because we have forgotten the first promise, or the first command with promise, which is to honor the father and the mother. And then add to that all the junk that comes from these spoiled, rotten little brats, where they are smiting their parents, where they are, um, where they are, you know, disrespecting and cursing their father and mother in that in that fashion and no wonder when our when our world is just falling apart that's the foundations of a nation that's why god gave it a promise associated with it if you will simply just honor and respect and treat decently people that are older than you especially your parents you're gonna have long life your nation's going to be blessed in that. Why? Because you are ensuring that future generations will grow up with some respect, with some decency, and then they will treat the elder with some sort of dignity. It's Mother's Day. Your mother went through a lot to raise you. And people that are wise understand, especially when they start having children of their own, man, kids are a lot of work. And whether my mom was a Christian or not, whether she drank alcohol or not, I'm here standing this here this day, and all of us are too. We've survived our childhood. We've survived our teenage years. We're now grown adults having our own children. That means mom and dad did something right, and they deserve some sort of respect for that. Amen. Treat them with respect. Treat them with dignity, and especially on a day like this, just give them honor for that. Because it's a lot of work raising up children. And when you do that, you create generation after generation after generation that has that same mindset, which produces generations after generations after generations. And then the word of God comes to fruition. It comes to pass because we have done what God said to do. Honor, respect them. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. <clears throat> but because, because... Because these punishments aren't carried out speedily, nobody fears God. And that was the sin of Amalek. We recorded in that context. We saw it recorded there. Was that they feared not God, and therefore they had no regard for the feeble, the old. They had no regard for the children, for the, for the slower oxen, the possessions of other people. No regard whatsoever. Deuteronomy 21, look in verse 18. This is another one that people, especially atheists, atheists and agnostics, like to bring to our attention. Deuteronomy chapter 21, they say in verse 18, Well, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the word of God here, but this is how they'll mock, which will not obey the voice of his father or mother, that when they have chastened him and will not hearken unto him, oh, they, they skip all that. They just go down and say, stone him with stones. Okay, but let's look at the context of the scriptures here and how God actually outlines the stoning of the rebellious son. Okay? 
This is biblical, and I believe we should we should have this on the book stay in the in the in the government of Canada. This should be a law. Amen. It'd be a righteous nation if we did. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, it says, Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city, unto the gate of the place. So what is happening here? This child will not obey. It says, when they have chastened him. So first step is that the parents try to teach this child, teach this, no, sorry, son to obey, and they have refused. Chastening has taken place, and we know that this is very much a, a, a missing a, a component in, in our nation, even where there's, there's, almost, there's laws against chastening and proper discipline to a child. But it says, when they have chastened him and will not hearken unto them, then the father and mother, verse 19, bring that child to the elders. So what took place? They were teaching him right. They were trying to correct the son. They were trying to get him on the right path. They were chastening him, even correcting him with, with punishment, with, with discipline, stern discipline. He still would not hearken unto them. Finally, the last ditch effort is to bring him to the elders. And it says in verse 20, and they shall say, this is all the elders, they shall say unto the elders of the city, this is our son, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And do you know what that tells me? He's not just a little child. Mm. He is a drunkard. He is a glutton. He's not obeying his parents. He's a grown, teenage, maybe derelict, bomb. We all know one. We've all seen one, right? We grew up with them. He will not hear reason. He will not be corrected. And yet he's going to continue to be gluttonous, meaning he's eating off of somebody else because this rebellious drunkard would surely not get a job and support himself. He's stubborn. He's rebellious. So no one's going to hire a fool like that. And so, in verse 21, all the men of his city shall stone him with stones. You see how there's a unanimous decision there? Everybody has agreed. In other words, they've all probably been ripped off by this bomb. They've all probably been disrespected by this bomb. They all knew him very well. When they brought him unto them, surely they even questioned him. Maybe they even further tried to chasten him, reason with him. Get your act straight. What is wrong with you? Will you not hear the voice of reason coming from your parents as they try to instruct you? All the men unanimously make the decision to what? Stone him with stones that he died. So shall thou put away from among you. And here's a wonderful side effect. Thou shalt put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Something like this type of corporal punishment would only need to be carried out once or twice a year. Some derelict would push things too far, would be put to death, and the wonderful consequence of all that would be that everyone would have ease of that evil person and they would see and fear so the next person would grow to be a derelict wouldn't follow after the past of that loser of that bum that rebellious son as the bible says and we would have a wonderful scenario where that would be cleansed from us and people would stop raising rebellious children and rebellious children would think twice about disobeying their parents because they'd say hey you remember uncle jim Remember how he grew up when he was about 20? We had enough of him. We pleaded with him. We tried to correct him. We tried to get him on the right track. We even brought him to the elders and they couldn't get through to him. And he was stoned and put to death and died that death. You're on that pathway, mister. Straighten up and fly right. How many kids would just be like, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And suddenly live righteously. Because they have seen what happens when they do wrong. You gotta be put to death for cursing your father and cursing your mother. <clears throat> now go to Deuteronomy chapter 31, just a few pages over. Deuteronomy chapter 31. What is rebellion biblically? I described it from uh, the standpoint of, of how it ties in with witchcraft. And, uh, you know, even how the, the, the dictionary says it's open resistance to established authority. Biblically, I got a good definition here. Within Deuteronomy chapter 31, in verse 27, it says, For I know thy rebellion, and thy stiff neck. And that's the first mention of that word rebellion. 
Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? So he's saying your neck is stiff. In other words, you, you, you've, you've tightened up. You're, you're, you're going to remain stubborn. You, you've got a stiff neck. You're not going to yield. You're not going to bend. You're not going to, you're not going to be corrected even if we try to correct you. And Moses here is talking to the children of Israel, and he says, you've been this way since I've been alive. How much the more once I'm dead and gone? Rebellious, stiff neck. That's one, one way of looking at it is having a stiff neck. Look at verse 29. It continues. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Further definitions is one that would self-corrupt themselves. You will corrupt yourselves. It says these rebellious, or rebellion is when you turn aside from the way that God sets forth. When you turn aside from his commandment. When you do evil, when you do harm, when you do a hurt. And when you do it with the works of your hands, and they're all geared there, the Bible says, to provoking the Lord to anger. That's rebellion in a nutshell. And that is what so many people, even in little small doses, exhibit every single time God says to you, Thus saith the Lord, and I say, Thus chooseth I. <laughs> do as I will shall be the whole of the law. It's basically Satanism, witchcraft, this world in a nutshell. Just do as you please. Live free, bro. I'm going to do what's best for me. That's not God's way. God's way is, I said you do it. Okay? And if you do it, it would be well for you. He promises that so many times. Do what I say and it will be well with you. We'll read about that as we go through Deuteronomy. He says it regarding the land. He says it regarding the blessing. He says it regarding the multi multiplication. He says it regarding the nation. That if ye will do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, I will bless. I will strengthen. I will multiply. I will keep you in the land that I have promised you. But if ye will not and rebel instead, then the punishments are due, and God is not slack concerning issuing those punishments unto his people. So the works of your hands, that rebellion, it's always self-motivated, it's always self-enacted, it's always self-aggrandizing, and it's always to your own self being in destruction. And more so in the latter days, we can look for, and we can hope for, and we can expect that rebellion will multiply as the sin of witchcraft by the policy given power unto craft to prosper multiplies you're going to see more and more people reaping what they are sowing and falling into the rebellion trap that god has for them beast behavior go to leviticus chapter 20 13 another form of rebellion leviticus 20 leviticus 20 another form of rebellion is acting like a beast acting like an animal Leviticus chapter 20, beginning in verse 13. The Bible says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And we can leave that there. In the same context, what do we have? Look a few verses later in verse 15. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lay down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast, they shall surely be put to death, their blood should be upon them. If Canada put this law into practice, I would shout amen and amen. amen. Glory to God. Amen. Beast behavior, it's wickedness, it's confusion, it's abomination, it makes God sick to his stomach, it ought to make us sick to our stomach. And the context is the same. Man with man, two, two verses later, man with beast, woman with beast. I mean, we always look at the context when we're studying scriptures, correct? I want to deal with the second, beast behavior, laying down there too with a beast. The Bible is clear. A man lay with the beast, he's put to death, and so is that defiled beast. A woman lay down into a beast, she is put to death, and so is that animal. Their blood shall be upon them. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Beast behavior. 
Nothing more, nothing less, because, because humans don't act that way. There's some sort of connection within humans called their conscience that will not allow them to cross over into a line like that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 23, it says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So we're made in the image of God, and then men decide they know better, so they're just going to make God into their own image. And what image should they choose? Beasts. Whenever a man chooses their own God, it's a beast. When a man chooses their own God, even if they're making it themselves, they walk that line long enough, they're worshiping a beast. Because a man that rejects God, refuses God, wants nothing to do with God, is only on an inevitable pathway to becoming a beast himself. The Bible promises that, Romans chapter 1, verse 23. Wherefore, verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense for their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And so they got their wish. They refused God and having him as part of their knowledge, though they knew him, the Bible's clear, they knew him, rejected him, refused him to be part of their knowledge. God said, all right, I'll turn you over to do more wickedness. I'll turn you over to forget I even existed. I want nothing to do with me. I want nothing to do with you, gives them over to the reprobate mind, which causes them to fall into more of these hurtful and disgusting lusts, turning nature on its course, on its head, and in complete rebellion to the order of things. They changed the natural use into that which is against nature, corrupting it, flipping it on its head. They left the natural use and instead burned in their lust one toward another. And here in the context, burned towards beasts even, worshiping and serving them more than the Creator. And they went after things which are not convenient. Convenience, that means it's fitting, that means it's normal, that means it's natural, that means it's easily acquired. They go out of their way to do filth and disgust in things. They go out of their way to follow after that which is against nature, against God, and more like the beast's heart that they have. Beast behavior is something, the Bible says, their blood shall be upon them. They ought to be put to death, and I believe they should be in this nation. You lay down with a beast, you lay down before a beast, you lay down with the same gender, you ought to be put to death, according to Amen. the scriptures that we have before us. The final one is blasphemy. blasphemy. Now, I will add that, as we saw reading through Romans, and you can go to Leviticus chapter 24, it wasn't the act that caused them to be rejected of God. It was them rejecting God that caused them to be rejected of God. It actually was the catalyst that led to them doing more of this disgusting and filthy behavior. And so the sin of sodomy doesn't make one reprobate, but they're a reprobate because, sorry, the sin of sodomy doesn't make them a reprobate, but because they're a reprobate, they commit the sin of sodomy, bestiality, and all of these other things. It's a symptom of the effect that their heart had when it changed to a beast's heart, when God turned them over to that reprobate mind. And the same is true, I believe, about this next one. Blasphemy, blasphemy. Go to Leviticus chapter 24 and in verse 10. Leviticus 24 and verse 10. <clears throat> and the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and this son of the Israelitish woman, and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. Verse 11, And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shalometh, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And so, there was a strife that took place, and some will excuse the things that come out of their mouth 
whenever there's a dispute or a strife or a heated incident or, or something happens that is beyond the norm. But here God's going to show that you ought not let your words fly in the heat of the moment. Verse 11 records that they blasphemed or spoke irreverently against God and against all that is sacred, and also cursed. Verse 12 continues, and it says, And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And so they bring to judgment the man, the child, the, the young man, here that had blasphemed and cursed the name of the Lord. Verse 14 says, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp. And they let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. So bring out all the witnesses, and there to basically lay their hand upon his head, indicating, yes, I heard the blasphemy. Yes, I heard the cursing. And there's going to be what? At least two or three at that time. Then all the congregation shall gather together and stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, So the judgment took place, the witnesses were shown, at least two or three would have put their hands on him and indicated, Yep, we heard the blasphemy, we heard the cursing come from his mouth. All the congregation of Israel shall stone them, and then they get a Bible lesson. Not only did they see the witness, they saw, the, they saw that, that activity take place where the man was stoned, but they get a Bible study here in verse 15. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land. When he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall he be put to death. And I believe God isn't any, any he's not lax concerning the same truth. Don't run your mouth even in the heat of a moment and, and find yourself blaspheming the name of the Lord, cursing in his name. The Bible lesson is clear. Curseth your God, bear your sin. Curseth your God, bear your sin. And while the nation here, because the Lord is surely not Canada's God, the people here, the Canadians have the Lord as their God, but the nation as a whole has turned to what? Secular humanism, worshipping people, worshipping men, worshipping self, worshipping hockey, whatever, right? But God sees it fit that whosoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And while this is not on the books today, it's on his heart. And so blasphemy is something that ought to have somebody put to death for. The judgment in this man's life is surely carried out. Now go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And so this was a situation where um, tent, it was tense. Emotions were running high. The, the man blasphemed with his mouth and then cursed in the name of the Lord. And, and the congregation who witnessed it signified it so and put him to death. Blasphemy, put to death. Speaking against the Lord, put to death. It ought to be so in a nation where God is the Lord. Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Thankful for grace. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now look down in verse 33 and it says this. Either make the tree good and his fruit good. Or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Look at that. The tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That is saying that what is spoken is how the heart is known. As what is born of the tree is how the tree is known. Therefore, I think what we're seeing here is that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is for sure a sin, but what is the order of the sin that has taken place? First of all, I believe it is rejecting of the word of the Lord, right? Because the heart is going to be where, what speaks. So if somebody is going to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, 
Someone who's going to blaspheme even the Lord in this context shall be forgiven. But to blaspheme the Holy Ghost is revealing something about the heart. The heart is living in blasphemy, is living in contradiction, is living against God. And so it is spoken even as what is in the heart. What happens out of the mouth indicates what type of tree it is. And here, a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit, but only corrupt. Therefore, a corrupt heart cannot bring forth good words, but only a corrupt heart. And so, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, I believe, is exactly that. It's a symptom, but it's not the sin that made the reprobate. I believe it's a symptom of the sin. And look over when we can see that take place. In verse 22, the Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. Insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all of the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Would we not rejoice to see somebody who was blind and dumb from birth see and speak and be relieved of that? That would be a wonderful, blessed thing to see our Savior do that. Is not this the son of David? Is not this the son of God? Is this not, is this not our Messiah? And what happens in verse 25 as it continues, Jesus knew their thoughts. What were their thoughts? Verse 24. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And so that clearly, I believe, is the indication of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost he's talking about. Right in that same context. Attributing the work of God to the devil. Saying that Jesus doth not his good works, but by the prince of the devils, Beelzebub. And yet, within that same context, remember how Romans chapter 1 says, when they knew him, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, right? Neither were thankful, therefore God gave them up, therefore God gave them up, therefore God gave them over. We have the Pharisees doing the same thing. Because look back and you'll see in verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts, and he would often speak to that effect. Someone's thinking something like, man, this guy's, this guy's a devil. And he's like, what'd you say? Like, did you see, right? He would call them out on their thoughts sometimes, revealing that he knew their thoughts. Verse 15, you can go back, and it says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew and fell from thence. What did he know? That the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him, how that they might destroy them. And so not only did he know their thoughts, he knew their intentions. Well, the word of God is quick and powerful, revealing the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus is revealing himself to be the very word of God, to be as the people cried out when they saw the healing, the miracle. He's the son of David, the son of God that's here. He's our Messiah. In verse 8, look at this. For the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Justifying that he's doing the good works on the Sabbath day because he's the Lord of the Sabbath day. I can do what I will with my thing. What is he saying there? He's saying that I profess to be the Lord God here on earth. And so, God, even in this chapter, is revealing that he has shown the Pharisees to the point where they ought to know him as God. He's said it. He's done it. He's shown it. He's preached the word. He's, he's fulfilled the word. He's done divine healings. He's read their minds. He's deciphered their thoughts and intents of their heart and changed his, correct, his, his direction before they could even fall upon them. He's revealed himself. They knew he was God and yet glorified him not as God. Therefore, they reject it and the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost that happens there, that he's just a devil. He's just doing this power by the devil is just simply the, the effect of the fact that they've been given over to a reprobate mind. These are just simply showing forth that they are capable of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. They're capable of releasing from their heart corrupt things because their heart is corrupt. They rejected God, and that blasphemy, I believe, is simply evidence of a corrupt heart. And the Bible is clear that when you have a corrupt heart, there's no forgiveness. When God gives you up, God gives you up, God gives you over to the reprobate mind to do those things, to act that way, to say these things... There is no forgiveness in this life, neither in the world which is to come. The Bible is clear here. So that's what I believe is, is, is the teaching there of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And blasphemy in general, it was a death penalty. So you ought to be put to death for speaking that way. And Christians ought to watch our mouths, therefore. And not even in a, in a tense moment, let something that might be a curse to our Savior or blasphemy of his, his heart or blasphemy against him come out. 
But that also shows me that it's not just the blasphemy that's going to be the, the cause and effect of somebody becoming a reprobate. I believe that it's just a symptom of it. It's one way that we can tell when somebody would say such a foolish thing that, that, that Jesus is just doing works by the devil. I mean, come on. No Christian is going to say something like that. No Christian is going to let something come to an end. But because of our flesh and because of our, our worldly growing up, we might once in a while yell out a JC when something lands your toe. It, it happens, especially with new believers, right? We're just, we grow up a certain way, saying a certain thing, acting a certain way, and when times get tough. The Bible is clear that that would give you a death penalty, but it doesn't give you the death penalty that says, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. The Bible says clearly that whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man. It's a wrong and wicked thing to do. It shall be forgiven him, right? In this life and in the life to come, of course. But that's the New Testament teaching. The Old Testament teaches, and I believe if we were in a godly Christian nation, and one day we will be in a godly Christian nation with godly Christian laws, then speaking a word, blasphemy against the Spirit of God, will put somebody to death at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. Thank you, God, for...